Africans and Native Americans, the language of race, and the evolution of red black peoples. So he begins his book in chapter one, uh, is talking about Africans and Americans' intercontinental contacts across the Atlantic to 1500. It is now well known that the Atlantic Ocean contains a series of powerful rivers or currents which can facilitate the movement of floating objects from the Americas to Europe and Africa as well as from the latter to the Americas. In the North Atlantic, the most prominent current is that of the Gulf Stream, which swings through the Caribbean and then moves in a northeasterly direction from Florida to the Grand Banks of Terra Nova or Newfoundland, turning then eastward towards the British Isles and the Bay of Biscay, that's in Europe. This current has carried debris from Jamaica and the Caribbean to the Hebrides and Orkneys of Scotland. All right, so it says that this current, again, you didn't hear is that it can carry debris from all the way, you know, in Jamaica, all the way to Europe. All right, without no paddles, without, you know, nobody taking it over there, just by floating, it's getting to uh, Europe from Jamaica debris. All right, moreover, Jean Marion tells us the valuable hardwood was commonly washed ashore along the coast of Ireland and Wales. This timber from ocean, from the ocean borne by the Gulf Stream really came from the rivers of Mexico. All right. Marine, a student of transatlantic navigation by small vessels also states that the first attempt, the first success of crossing the Atlantic by one man could only come from the American side. Again, the first success of crossing the Atlantic by one man could only come from the American side. Because the crossing is much less difficult in that direction, a French writer has said justly in all probability that if America had been the old world, its inhabitants would have discovered Europe long before we did in fact discover America. So this French guy is clearly telling us that if America is the old world and we know it is, right? that its inhabitants would have discovered Europe long before we did, all right, or Africa. This is because of the prevailing winds from the west as well as the currents. One can, says Marion, sail in a straight line from Boston via Newfoundland to Ireland or Cornwall with almost the certainty of fair winds. The other direction requires twice the distance, twice the time, four times the sweat so you're hearing this right so it's a lot harder to come from that side of the earth you know from uh, europe west africa to america it's a lot easier to go from this side to that side all right it's less work uh, with fair winds on your back right so you can sail over there sail over there without paddles in this context 
it is also worth noting a report that Columbus had information about strange people from the West who had reached Ireland prior to 1492, doubtless via the Gulf Stream. Marion tells us that Bartholomew or Christopher Columbus had made marginal notes in their copy of Pius II's Historia 1477 to the effect that some men have come from Cathay by heading east. We have seen more than one remarkable thing, especially in Galway and Ireland. Two people tied to wrecks, a man and a woman, a superb creature. Marion also believes that the first documented case of single navigator crossing the Atlantic consists in record of a Native American who reached the Iberian Peninsula long before Columbus Day. And here's the account it says, In the Middle Ages there arrived one day on the coast of Spain a man, red and strange, red, right, copper colored, and a craft described as a hollow tree or canoe, right, from the recorded description which specifically states that he was not a Negro, he might well have been a native of America in a piragua, a dugout canoe. The unfortunate man, ill and enfeebled, died before he was had been taught to make himself understood, right, so they couldn't get who he was supposedly. As Bartholomew de las Casas and his monumental Historia de las Indias cites examples of rafts or canoes, almadias, dead Americans and their breeds reaching the Azor Islands before 1492. This evidence will be discussed below. Here it is only necessary to know that the Azores lay in an area weak of currents but that even so, with the help of winds from the west and northwest, some boats could have reached the islands from the Americas. And continuing, it says, of course, one of the problems with the argument for early transatlantic crossings is that in the modern period, such islands as Iceland, Bermuda, the Azores, the Madeiras, the Cabo Verdes, Tristan de Cunha, Ascension, and even Sao Tome of Nigeria and Cameroon were uninhabited prior to the documented Irish, Norse, and Portuguese occupations. On the other hand, some of these islands are small or far from major currents. Bartolome de las Casas states that the Azores, where the Islas Casiderides mentioned by Strabo in his geography, and which islands were repeatedly visited by the Carthaginians, Carthaginians. allegedly there lived in the Azores a people who were of Loro or ba Basso color. That is to say, people of the color of Native Americans or intermediate between white and black. The Canary Islands were inhabited in the 15th century by people who were isolated from nearby Africa and whose cultures somewhat resembled those of some Americans. All right, so look, so there's evidence there of these West African uh, uh, islands, right? Places of a lot of American influence, uh, cultural influence there. Moreover, the personal names of the many Canarios enslaved by the Spanish have decidedly American ring about them. Although such resemblances do not always mean a great deal, the Canarios are sometimes described as loro or brownish colored people in the slave registers. So the Canarios are, you know, brownish colored people or copper colored people, right? The fact that the islands of Cabo Verde and Madeira were uninhabited in the 15th century does indeed pose a problem for African navigation to the Americas. So they're saying, you know, because there was no people there, so, you know, who was really going back and forth first? Because we know that they, in the Americas, we it was populated since ancient times, right? However, that will be discussed later, he says. Now it is necessary to consider briefly evidence relating to the marine time capabilities of Americans in the late 15th century to see whether voyages across the Atlantic might have been feasible. So the Americans of the Caribbean region were outstanding navigators and seamen, as noted by the Spaniards and other Europeans. Christopher Columbus was impressed everywhere by their skill. He noted, for example, that their boats, barcos and barquillos, which they called canoas or canoes, were ex excellently made from a single tree, were very large and long, carrying sometimes 40 to 45 men, two or more kodos, perhaps a man's breath and width. The American boats were unsinkable, 
All right. Again, the American boats were unsinkable. And if in a storm they happened to capsize, the sailors simply turned them back over while swimming in the sea, bailing them out with gourds carried for that purpose. Andres Bernaldez recorded from Columbus that the Americans navigated in, the, in their canoes with exceptional agility and speed, with 60 to 80 men in them, each with an oar. 60 to 80 men and they went by sea 150 leagues or more they were masters of the sea a canoe was later discovered in jamaica which was 96 feet long eight feet broad made from a single tree that is huge so we got this account of columbus you know saying how you know the agility and the speed of the canoes they you know they could carry 80 men they went they were masters of the sea this is in columbus words masters of the sea and they even found one in jamaica 96 feet long that's long right columbus found that the lucayo people of the bahamas were not only very well acquainted with cuba one and a half days away with canoe but also knew that from cuba it was 10 days journey to the mainland Doubtlessly, doubtless Mexico or South America, since Florida would have been closer than that. He also saw a boat which was 95 palms long, in which 150 persons could be contained and navigate. 150 persons? Come on, that's a ship. Yeah, right? Like these Spanish and Portuguese ships that contain those many people. This is basically a ship, right? 95 palms long, it says. 150 persons you can put 100 did they ever tell you in, in in school that the indians made canoes that can fit 150 people that's a ship all right so i'm picturing like these phoenician type ships you know with this just paddles right how they draw the phoenician ships all right so because we're going to read that they even had sails over here others were seen which were of great workmanship and beauty being expertly carved a canoe was also seen being navigated successfully by one man in high winds and rough sea. At Haiti, Columbus learned that the island of Jamaica was 10 days journey distant from the mainland and that the people there were closed, thus referring to Mexico or Yucatan most likely. In another place he learned of a land a hundred leagues away where gold was mined. The Arawak and Carib speaking people of the Car Caribbean were well informed geographically. Columbus captured Caribs in the Antilles such as Guadeloupe from whom he learned of the South American mainland but he also learned of the mainland from Americans living on St. Croix and Borinco in Puerto Rico. Americans who were taken into Europe drew maps there which showed Haiti, Cuba and the Bahamas as well as many other islands and countries which were named in the native language so the Indians taught Columbus and these Europeans about the rest of the islands. That's how they found them so easy. And continuing in this book, it says, Even more significant for our purposes is the fact that when the Spaniards reached Yucatan in 1517, they saw ten large canoes called piraguas, full of Indians from the town, approaching us with oars and sails. The canoes were large ones made like hollows, hollow throws, cleverly cut out from huge single logs and many of them would hold 40 indians the fact that these boats were equipped with sails is indeed interesting because it means that wind power could be used to run against currents or to navigate rapidly even where currents were lacking clinton r edwards also cites other evidence documenting the, the use of sails by carib and other american peoples in the caribbean and ecuadorian north peruvian sailors in the pacific both at the time of initial spanish contact an example of the navigation capabilities of the Caribbean natives, we can cite the case in 1516 when 70 or 80 Spaniards in a Carabelle Bergantine brig sailed from Santiago to Cuba to Waxanla, Honduras, now Roatan. There they enslaved many Guanaxa people and carried them in the Carabelle to Havana, Cuba. All right, so they enslaved Indians, right? In 1516, the Waxana people and carried them to Havana, right? So remember that the Americans were subsequently able to overcome their Spanish guards, seizing the sail ships and Isiendose de la Vela, 
cual si fueran expertos navegantes volvieron a su patria. So it's saying uh, basically that they took over the ship. These Indians, right? These Guanaxa people from Honduras, right? It's probably most likely so-called Negroes, right? They took over the ship and they went back, right? And so we got accounts and we saw part three that rebellious slaves, right? Negro slaves took over some ships and shipwrecked of the Mosquito Coast, right? And that was in Honduras as well. So we always got to make sure when they're talking about some Africans, you know, took over ship, were these really Africans? But you can see here clearly that Indians took over ships and even took them back to their land. It says they were able to sail from Havana to Honduras, a distance of more than 200 leagues in a European vessel with no assistance from any non-Americans. And this after having been kept below the decks during their journey to Havana. So they knew how to sail, basically, is what he's trying to say. The navigational capabilities of the Americans of the Caribbean Mexican coastal area extend back well into pre-Columbian times, as attested to by pictures of boats found in various codices, murals, and sculptured walls, in the Mexico Yucatan region. In about the 10th century AD, also the Mexican leader Quetzalcoatl is recorded as having sailed with a raft to the east, rising, rising sun from the Gulf Coast of Central Mexico. Along the Atlantic coast of North America, Americans also went out to sea. On the South Carolina coast, for example, the Seawee outfitted a boats with sails and on one occasion a group of natives decided to visit England. They outfitted a canoe with sails and went out into the Atlantic but were picked up by British vessel and sold as slaves. All right, Again, some Indians that were navigating, they were heading to England, were captured on the open sea by British vessel and sold as slaves. So when they were coming back, they were most likely said they were African. That's what they told people, or that's what they teach you in history today. And I actually went to the footnote of this uh, book. And it's from a book called A New Voyage to Carolina, written in 1709 by John Lawson. So it's actually in there, that account. I, a lot of these, uh, I like to use, I'm using this book on purpose because he's referencing a lot of his sources are accurate. I went to verify them. So he has all this information in his book. So, you know, I'm reading off of his book, but these are actual verifiable sources he's using. To the south along the Brazilian coast, the Portuguese and other Europeans also witnessed American navigation at sea. An Italian traveling with Magellan in 1519 noted that the Brazilian boats were made from the trunk of a tree and were so large that each boat held 30 to 40 men. In the 1550s, Hans Staden noted that the dugout boats of the Santos Rio de Janeiro area could hold up to 30 men, were four feet in width, and with some being larger than, and some smaller. And these they moved rapidly with oars, navigating with them as far as they wish. When the, when the sea is rough, they take the canoes ashore until good weather comes again. They do not go more than two leagues straight out to the sea, but along the coast they navigate far. In 1565, the Jesuit Jose de Anchieta stated that the Americans of the same region had dozens of, or more canoas made from a single tree with other pieces of the same cutting used as boards, well attached with vines. They were large enough to carry 20 to 25 persons with their arms and supplies and some held up to 30 persons. With these boats they were able to cross such fierce brava seas that it is a frightful thing and not to be imagined or believed without seeing. Anchieta also noted that if the canoes turned over, the navigators simply bailed out the boat, turned their right side up, and carried on. Thus, the Brazilian boats were also very well made, were very fast and maneuver maneuverable, and could be righted at sea if necessary. They were used to carry warriors and supplies over considerable distances along the coast, as far as, for example, from Santo San Vicente to Rio de Janeiro. In general, it would appear that the Americans of the Caribbean built the biggest boats and were most accustomed to going far out to sea, while the Atlantic coastal groups were more oriented to staying within a certain distance of land, six miles or so. On the other hand, all were capable of being carried out to sea by strong winds and currents and yet surviving rough water. 
It should also be noted that several groups along the Pacific coast manufactured seaworthy craft and were capable of reaching Polynesia by means of favorable currents. It is beyond the scope of this study to discuss such voyages, but one must note that the many Pacific island peoples may very well be of American ancestry mixed with varying proportions of Oceanic Negro African with a question mark and Malayo Indonesian stocks. All right. So they put it all, they put it in parentheses and they put African question mark because they don't really know if they're African just because they're Negro. Right. So as you can see, Americans were very capable of crossing the sea, going all out to the open ocean. Uh, as all these accounts just told us and even Columbus himself told us, especially with the western winds and, and Gulf Stream and currents in their favor. Even if they didn't plan to and got lost at sea and ended up on the other side of Europe or shipwrecked, you know, still, like the book said, like we just read, that if anybody ever did the transatlantic crossing or the Atlantic crossing, it would be from the America's side. This is the old world, antediluvian. As you see, they had colonies on that side of the world in Egypt, all the way into Italy, in the Mediterranean. All right, Atlantis slash America, like we read. We see that we had the oldest Y chromosome here found. Uh, it doesn't, uh, it predates over 200,000 years old. The genetic atoms that was supposedly in Africa, it predates, all right. We have the oldest pyramids, we have agriculture, the oldest mummies. We saw that a lot of the foods in Africa, 600 of them are from America, the food crops. All right, we saw that in Brazil, clearly they found Negroid skeletons and people living there, you know, that had nothing to do with Africa. Look more like uh, Southeast Asian, Polynesian, actually. So again, we're going to...